Well, welcome to Talking Science. Uh, we're back. We had a little bit of a hiatus last week. Uh, Brad was busy teaching people all about science. Brad, it's uh, fantastic to see you once again. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we were trying, for people who don't realize, we were trying to connect on plane Wi Fi uh, and it, it just wasn't <laughs> happening for the audio. I apologize. You know, it's funny. I was talking about the wonders of technology, and I've actually, I was on a flight from San Francisco to Sydney. And I used the plain Wi-Fi to remotely log into a telescope at Siding Spring and ish get an observation off. So technology's come a long way in space. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I still don't get Vodafone reception in camera. You know, who knows? Why, why would you bother? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, hey, uh, how's the weather down there in Canberra on this uh, beautiful Tuesday morning here in Brisbane? Look at it. It surprisingly is quite nice. Uh, we've had some cold nights. Um, it's warmed up surprisingly since Saturday. I don't know. Maybe that's all uh, the blood that's been spilt from the election this week, and it's warmed the waters of Canberra, so to speak. Like Billy Griffin's a nice uh, shade of scarlet. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. I, I saw some yeah, campaign posters, I think, waiting in the waves at the same time. That just might have been <laughs> political careers. It's all the same in Chris. <laughs> Well, political dreams have been shattered uh, over the weekend, as you, as you said, here in Australia. Uh, but that means nothing to science because it, it never sleeps, it never takes a vacation, and it certainly waits for no man or woman at all. That's, Isn't that right? That Brad? is definitely right, and that's the great thing. It keep, the universe keeps ticking on regardless of us. <laughs> well, speaking of ticking on, we've uh, learnt a little bit about the April 20 mishap from SpaceX, turns out the uh, the Crew Dragon went kaboom. Yeah, that's a. It, when you hear anomaly in rocket speak, that means something blew up. <laughs> and, and so yeah, so as we talked about, right, there was that anomaly reported last month um, where people saw smoke leaving Cape Canaveral um, when they were testing the uh, Crew Dragon. This was the uh, capsule that could carry humans into space, and it was the one that was used in March. We knew something went wrong from all the reports. Uh, they have now officially said, yes, something went wrong, and it's exactly kind of what we thought, and that was during the testing of the abort phase. So when the capsule tries to abort away from the rocket, if the rock's about to explode, when they fired those thrusters, something went wrong when the firing of the thrusters, and the entire capsule essentially lit up and ignited and was destroyed. So it's a complete loss. It's a little bit of a problem when you're abort stage. Does the opposite. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, look, and it's interesting because, you know, I, I maybe it's one of the subtle things that hasn't necessarily been emphasized, right? So these thrusters have been tested multiple times. I think they said something like a thousand times um, over the course of just normal operation, normal assembly and that sort of thing. The only thing that changed, and, you know, this is it. This is why you investigate, is that this capsule went into space, this rocket has gone into space, and it's now been redocked. So it could be that there's a malfunction when it actually goes in the docking process of the space station or that. And that's a big deal, because that's why you test it in all the different configurations and scenarios to make sure something like this doesn't happen. Um, so you know, there's going to be a lot of work that has to go into to figuring out exactly what the cause is, why. Uh, and then, you know, assuming they figure out why, they have to test the new capsules to make sure it doesn't happen and kind of go through a whole nother reprocess of testing. So while NASA and SpaceX has said, oh, it hasn't changed their July timeline, I see no, no way that the July timeline of launching a U.S. astronaut happens. Mm -hmm. And it's it's an interesting change up in the way that um, the American rockets are, are being designed, or these crewed rockets. Uh, you know, back in the Saturn Five days and the Apollo days, we had the um, the pull mechanism for uh, abort stages. Yep. Uh, so so that would be that's your longer nose of the rocket, and and it would pull the crew capsule away. SpaceX are now using the push method, which means that the thrusters are a lot closer. Uh, and it's all about a design, really, isn't it? To yeah. Get more windows in there and be a little bit more touristy, I think, is what I was reading. That's right. I mean, because they can get 
four seats. They can get four passengers. Well, previously it's only been three. As I said, they can get more room, as you, and you said the views, and for potentially passengers. So all these little design things actually matter, and and it's important. That's why you know people might think, oh, well, we've been sending people up and capsules up. It's true, but every little design has to be test. It's it's exactly like a car, or you know maybe in an airplane is a great example, right? You know you look at the troubles with the Boeing 737 Max, right? Mm -hmm. That that 737 line has been used for 30 or 40 years or something like that. They do a small alteration, and all of a sudden they have huge problems. So just because something has worked in the past, and if you do a few tweaks, it doesn't mean it will just smoothly work into the future. And while this capsule, the similar capsule, has been used for the cargo, again those little tweaks for the human aspect, the windows, the seats, all that sort of stuff, the thrusters, the weight of boards, all has a big impact on the functionality. Um, and so that's why it's tested to make sure this doesn't happen uh, with people on board. Well, yeah, now, now's the best time for things to blow up, really, isn't it? It, it really is. Like, it seems silly, but this is the this is the reason you get the mistakes out early, so you don't have it at critical phases. Well, from one space program to another, and uh, Jeff Bezos of Amazon fame, his uh, space program, Blue Origin, have unveiled their lunar lander, and uh, they're calling it Blue Moon. That's right. Perfect naming. Um, so this <laughs> was in a, in a big, uh, last Friday, a very big kind of um, really Steve Jobs-esque production of unveiling where it was a closed room, reporters were invited, but it was closed. They couldn't report on what was happening during the time, and then everyone rushed out, you know, and file the reports and, and their stories. Um, so uh, what was unveiled is that, well, firstly, you know, they unveiled or, or Jeff Bezos unveiled um, what they have been reportedly working on for the past three years, and that is a lunar lander. So this isn't necessarily a capsule to keep carry people. This would be the attachment to the um, module that would drop off of it. If you imagine the old Apollo missions, this drops off and lands on the surface of the moon and then people go and do whatever it is they do. They said they've been developing it for three years um, and you know they're really close to being it ready to go. And it was really great, you know, it's, um, and I think there's a lot to, the, to what they did. You know, firstly, uh, when we think about getting back to the moon, as we've talked about, it's going to happen in different stages. There's different parts to getting to the moon. There's getting off the Earth. There's the rocket. There's the capsule that people have to get into. And there's the lander, lander to get down to the surface. And I think what Jeff Bezos and others are trying to show, and then SpaceX, is that it's you know NASA did all of this in the past, but it took you know, five, eight, 10,000 people and just whatever, a blank check from President Kennedy to get it done. Um, that, that was how that happened, right? When you throw a lot of people not any money, it's becoming harder, they're becoming more efficient and they wanna do other things. And I think this was a big pitch to say, all right, Blue Origin will contribute this piece of the lunar race. Um, and I think it was a big play to say, all right, hey, we are already so far. You just give us a little bit more development money. We will finish it off for you, and this will be your ride down to the surface. And you can focus finishing off the Orion capsule, the thing that will take humans into space, which NASA is really ready to test in the next year, and rocket stuff. So I think what we will see to get to this 2024 of the goal to the moon that we talked about a couple of weeks ago with the u.s announcement is that it will be a collaboration between private companies and nasa coming together it's really fascinating this this uh, blue moon uh it's going to be able to land uh, on the lunar surface with up to 6500 kilos of payload uh, within 23 meters of accuracy uh, it's just incredible <laughs> And, and, and the key part there is not only the accuracy, I mean, it, it, it's the payload, right? Uh, you know, uh, famously, um, the Apollo astronauts left all of their nappies on the moon um, <laughs> because weight was important, because it couldn't take that much weight. If you can take 6,500 kilos, that means you can actually move certain stuff down to the surface, right? You can start moving things to the surface. You can start potentially landing cargo and building things towards a moon base and a moon colony. And it really sounds out there, but NASA is already building the gateway, the space station around the moon, for people to pop up and down to the surface. So you can imagine that people are going, you know, you kind of have people, we have Earth goes to the space station and stuff docks with it, and then you go space station to moon space station, and then moon space station to moon surface. Essentially kind of like 
travel, right? You know, we go from our homes to the airport and then to another airport and then from that airport to our destination. That's how it's ramping up. I think they've entered the race in a big way. Uh, and I think it will be even more interesting over the next six months to a year to see how this all develops. Hey, listen, getting getting to the moon is one thing, but uh, surviving on the moon is, is quite another thing. Um, turns out the, uh, the lunar surface could be a little bit active. It, it's moving around a little bit. It is, you know, that you say you feel the earth move underneath your feet while you feel the moon me- move kind of underneath your feet, but you're still floating around. <laughs> so uh, kind of one of the cool things that happened with the Apollo missions, you know, it's always funny when people talk about the moon landing didn't happen because so many cool things happened beyond people walking on the moon, right? There was the, the, the rocks, they left the metal reflector plates for lunar ranging, and they measured moon quakes. They literally got data to measure that there was quakes or there was geological activity on the moon. And I think that was an amazing thing. And so people have been looking at the data recently um, as we've gotten new imaging from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. So this is a high resolution imaging of a a spacecraft in orbit around the moon. And what people have realized is that the moon is is kind of shriveling, that the the surface is, is active, but it's slowly shrinking and it's forming cracks and crevices. And where these happen, we're seeing moonquakes, or that's where the data of the moonquakes really showed, is that in the, the fissures, essentially, on near the surface of the moon, that's where a lot of the moonquakes were happening. So in fact, the moon is still geologically uh, active. It's not just this boring, dead place that's just there. And it's... It's not like Earth, though, is it? There's no molten core uh, that's moving these tectonic plates, is it? No, that's right. It really is kind of like the crust. It really is the the outer layers shriveling. Uh, and, And so if we go back to how we think the moon formed, we think something large, about the size of Mars, but not Mars, crashed into the Earth. A whole bunch of rock and lava got ejected. That formed a ring system that eventually collapsed together to form the moon. So the moon didn't form like the other planets or, or, or Earth. It's kind of this hobbled, put together bunch of rocks that have been stuck together. So there is, that's why it is light, and that's why there isn't very little gravity. And so obviously when that formation happened, it still is actually kind of happening in that it's still, gravity still squishing it and squishing it and squishing it. In fact, what we realize is that Uh, the forces between the Earth and the Moon, this great tug of war that we play, kind of every time we tug on it, well, when the Moon tugs on us, we get tides, and when we tug on it, we kind of like shrivel the surface a little bit more. And this causes fissures, and this causes moonquakes, and so this is really interactive process. And and so I think a lot of people said, hey, the Moon isn't nearly as boring as we thought the past 40 years. That's kind of cool. Um, You know, as we talked about with the discovery of water abundant on the surface recently, and now this, the moon is a very interesting place, and this is just using 50-year-old data. Like, that's kind of the cool thing. I guess scientists are a little bit uh, of data hoarders. Yeah, and and, and I think this is – we don't like to throw things away for very good reasons. You know, we don't want to waste taxpayer money. But no, but like, secondly, it's because you never know what new things will happen, and then you can re-look at data. And some of the coolest discoveries have been happened from people like, oh – but what if we go look at this old data? What does it look like? Um, you know, a great example here is I'm undertaking a project to dig- digitize all of our old f- f- photographic plates from the 40s and 50s and 60s from the very old telescopes. Now, a lot of people are like, why do you want to do that? Well, if you have an image of the sky for 60 years, you can see how things change. If some things have disappeared, if something new is there. And people find crazy stuff all the time just by looking at old data with new information or new understandings. Um, And so it's cool. You can always find new things with old stuff. So we like to to recycle and, you know, we're great hoarders. (laughs) Well, I think you said it a couple of weeks ago as well that um, to find, trying to, I'm just going through my notes here, but I think it was about exoplanets and and stuff like that, about how it takes, you know, the the orbit of the of the object it takes that long and as you're saying you know 40 50 years uh 40 50 year old data 
there could be massive changes, as you've said. We, we could be, you, you could be finding new things with your project. Exactly. I mean, especially things on the outer edges of our own solar system, right? People are trying to find, including myself, Planet Nine, this potential new planet on the edge of our solar system. If one orbit is 30,000 years, it moves so slowly across the sky. And so to properly make the orbit, you need to see at least a good chunk of the orbit. So you'd need at least 50 years to see that. So really to see... To see the hard things, you know, people ask, oh, how could we miss a large planet on the edge of our solar system? And it's easy because it's really far and really hard to see, and it moves relatively really slow to us. And we just haven't been looking for that long. Uh, now, Planet Nine, if you do find it, I, I just want to put a public service announcement out there. Obviously, there will be a bit of a naming competition, and, yes. and I think the name of Planet Nine will end up being planet mcplanet face yes I, I really hope not my <laughs> vote is to not allow that people have their own views i kind of know what we would go what path we would go but yeah i think planet mcplanet face would be um <sighs> you brits <laughs> i, I kind of like the story of pluto right I, I don't think people appreciate how pluto got its name and that's because a, a nine-year-old girl wrote and said they should call it pluto and <laughs> That was the name. Like I, so, you know, we're not very good at naming things, so I can't throw stones. Well, one, one object that we have found that I don't think is Planet Nine is Ultima Thule, and uh, the results are coming in from that January flyby. That's right. Yeah, when we talked about when we were saying, you know, it was in the holidays and yes, yeah, science doesn't stop. Well, it's not the data still isn't all down. Like even <laughs> though that happened in January, it's going to take another, I think, four months to get the rest of the data because it's oh, so wow. far away to get there. But they have been analyzing the very first data and images that have come down. And so they found a lot of things. So the goal of Ultima Duel was to find something that is. Uh, like the most pristine, something that is essentially formed right after the formation of our solar system, but then kind of nothing happened to it. So it's a really a relic of what was there four and a half billion years ago. And so what they found is Ultima Thule, which looks like this snowman, it actually appears that the two lobes, or they're now calling one Ultima and one Thule, um, slowly came together over time. So they spun around slowly, 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 and then they kind of just gently merged. They didn't crash, they kind of just merged together. And it, there are very few meteor impacts, which means that it is, it's, you know, in the asteroid belt, there's lots of collisions, lots of things happening. We look at the moon, it's bombarded by craters. These don't, and that means it's not very active on the edge of our solar system. There's not a lot of stuff happening. And then looking at the surface, it appears that not much has changed on the surface in billions of years, and that this really is a snapshot of the stuff, what that was there, that was left over from the formation of the solar system four and a half billion years ago. So it ends up being this great target for people to study uh, the ingredients of our solar system. Now, many of the objects in the Kuiper Belt, uh, where Ultima Thule is, are accompanied by satellites or, or little moons. But our object here is is all by its lonesome. That's right. You know, you, you know, P even Pluto has four or five moons. The way you define it, lots of these other ones have moons that we found. And and this is one of the interesting things. It's just by itself. So again, it clearly formed in a place that there wasn't either a lot of stuff or wasn't what we call volatile. There wasn't a lot of things happening, and it kind of just hung out and stuck there. Uh, and so this is kind of, again, really great, because as we were just talking about, the moon interacts with the Earth and causes things on the Earth. Moons interact with their planets or the things they orbit. Um, so in this case, it doesn't appear to be so, and so it really is a snapshot of that beginning times. It's it's kind of like this thing is very boring and that's really good because we wanted something that was boring. Well, something that isn't boring is our Tuesday chats, talking Science. Dr. Brad Tucker, thank you so much uh, for checking in and uh, we'll talk to you next week. That's right. See you.